Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the astrology of May of 2022. And uh, we're going to start the episode by doing a little bit of a review of some things that have happened over the past month and their astrological relevance. Then we're going to jump uh, right into the forecast for May. So uh, yeah, welcome both of you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. So happy to be here. Hey. Yeah. Uh, hey, Austin. Steph, this is your first time on the podcast. Would you mind like introducing yourself just to our, our audience for people that are not familiar with your work? Sure. Yeah. So um, I was going by the moniker of the Daily Hunch for a few years, and I recently rebranded to Lady Kazemi. So I guess if you've seen me on Twitter or Instagram, that's probably uh, how you know me. Um, I am a consulting astrologer, and currently I'm also a contributor for Chani App, and that's kind of like the the majority of, uh, I guess, my practice at the moment. Nice. And you are an awesome writer, I have always noticed. So I was wanted to have you on the podcast because you have some really good metaphors. Um, and we'll get into some of that here later today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess that's kind of, I was, I was a writer before I was an astrologer. And so I guess to me, like astrology and the language of astrology is kind of just well, yeah, like what you said, it's a way of um, decoding the layer of metaphor that sort of encapsulates our experiences. Right, for sure. Uh, Austin, how are you doing? Welcome back. Uh, thank you. I am um, underslept and ready to go. Excellent. That is the best way to be. I am underslept and not ready to go. I'm feeling a little under the weather today, so just a heads up for everyone. I got food poisoning last night. Hilariously, I walked into the sandwich shop right as the moon Mars conjunction was going exact in Pisces. And I was like, you know, surely that's not going to be a big deal. You can buy a sandwich. What am I going to do? Like, you know, get murdered by a sandwich or something. And lo and behold, I did actually get sick from it and was like up all night. So I'm going to be a little out of it today, but I still wanted to do the show. And I know this is going to be a good forecast episode. Um, why don't we spend a little bit of time doing some review first, and then we'll jump in the forecast. So in terms of news and events, um, speaking of Moon-Mars conjunctions, we're super late to the party at this point because it happened immediately after our last forecast. But I know one of the things that everyone was talking about about a month ago since the last time we, we met was the um, Will Smith like famous slap thing. And there's been literally thousands of takes on it, so I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But there were just a couple of interesting transits that all the astrologers observed. And so I wanted to document that just for the sake of it being an interesting astrology example um, here before letting it go and, and hopefully everybody moving on because I think most people are kind of over it at this point. Did you guys did you watch it live or were you aware of it? I saw Twitter erupt. <laughs> okay. So I, I, was was... A, a, I was alerted shortly after it happened. Okay. So... Um, I was too, because I just saw Twitter explode, and it was just like one of the biggest sort of social media things that I've seen. So there's a little bit of uncertainty, I think, still surrounding his birth time, but this is the sort of provisional chart for Will Smith. Um, and it has the moon right there at 21 degrees of Scorpio um, and the midheaven at 14 degrees of Aquarius. So what's interesting about that um, is the night of the slap, um, there was a Moon-Mars conjunction that was taking place around 14 to 16 degrees of Aquarius, which is right on his midheaven. And the midheaven represents you know, success and career and reputation and all sorts of other things like that. Yeah, what, what is most visible in a life is the midheaven, right? Right. And then the other major transit I noticed was um, transiting Saturn at 21 degrees of Aquarius, squaring his moon. And if this chart is correct, he was born at night at sometime after 9 p.m., 9.47 p.m. So the moon is actually his, his sectolite, um, which gives it more importance in terms of the overall chart and his personality and, and different things about um, the life as a whole. And that's a pretty rough transit to have, to have transiting Saturn squaring one's moon at um, the time of this event. And the main thing, because I didn't have like a specific take, my only takes were one, I was impressed by how divisive it was. And I thought that was interesting as a moon Mars thing that just like people had wildly different opinions and everybody had an opinion about it. And there's so many different angles that people approached it from. 
um, for me, the primary thing that I noticed was it was just um, as an astrologer, it was an interesting case study to see somebody who hits what otherwise should be the highlight of his career, which is like finally getting an Oscar after like many, many years of, of working towards that as an actor and that being kind of seen as the pinnacle of success. But then due to one split second sort of decision kind of ruining that and then seeing him that he realized that it seemed like that night when he got up 10 minutes later after slapping um, Chris Rock, the comedian who had told a joke about Smith's wife. And then like 10 minutes later, he wins an Academy Award, um, which is just wild. But it seemed like he immediately knew that it had been messed up and he was like crying during the entirety of the speech. So um, I think it's an interesting example from an astrological standpoint, just from that perspective to think about like what could it mean to hit the high point of one's career, yet to have that overshadowed by something, you know, in some way? And that's that's sort of the extent of my take on it. Did you, Chris, either of Chris, you have you like put the chart back up? I just noticed something that speaks to your your observation. So <clears throat> the Mars on the midheaven and there being a slap is you know jumps right out. But also, if you look at um, if you look at his moon, right, which is, as you said, if he's a night chart, that's his sect light, right? That's the, the moon base of operations for the chart. And, you know, it's getting squared by Saturn rough. It's also getting perfectly squared by Venus. So that's a benefic. And it's getting a perfect trine from Jupiter, right? So it's double benefics, but then you also have double malefics, right? Which one way of saying like, oh, it was the best and worst night of my life. Right. Yeah. Or this was a there was a, an extremely auspicious thing happening and also a lot of trouble. Like it's it's I'm sure it's on other levels of the chart in addition to transits. But you can see the uh, the transits um, speaking to that as well. Yeah. And that's a question that astrology students sometimes have, which is, you know, what happens when I get both a good transit and a bad ha transit happening at the same time? And often the answer is, well, you, you get both. They don't necessarily cancel each other out, but you'll experience both extremes in some instances. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Anything else? Not in order to like not dwell on this. Or anything else before we move on? No. All right. Uh, what's the next story that we meant to review that we should not forget to before we, we move into the forecast? Well, I had a few quick observations about the uh, about uh, the UK, re, the Ukraine Russia war. Um, so I, I talked for a while last uh, last month about the besiegement of Venus, Venus being between Mars and Saturn, and we also noted that the degree of the exact conjunction uh, between Mars and Saturn was the exact degree of Ukraine's moon in the in the independence chart. And so what was, um, you know, for quite some time, the capital city, Kiev, of Ukraine was besieged, literally, right? So we had this besiegement in the sky and then besiegement on the ground. And it was literally the day that Venus escaped besiegement, which was March 29th, that um, the uh, the Russian troops withdrew from the besiegement of Kiev. Literally, besiegement ends above, and then the besiegement of the capital city ended within a day, right? And so that's pretty hard to ignore. Um, and then last month, I'd also speculated about um, some of the, the the conflict, the the military actions um, taking to the water once Mars moved into Pisces. And there's this curious thing where um, <clears throat> the day before Mars moved into Pisces, um, a oh I forget what I forget what the name of the class is, but it was a. Uh, um, it, it, the second largest battleship that the Russian Navy um, uh, has, uh, there's one class larger, but it's one of three. It was a flagship, um, was struck by um, Neptune missiles. Um, I believe they're like uh, shore to ship missiles from Ukraine. Um, and then it didn't sink until the next day. Um, and what's really interesting was the next day, which was April 14th, um, when it sank, Mars was not in Pisces yet, but it was going to move into Pisces in a matter of hours. And so it was the day of ingress into Pisces. And that made me think immediately of, uh, of the events of January 6th of last year, where 
um, the January 6th stuff happened the day of Mars's ingress into Taurus, right? And therefore, conjunction with Uranus and beginning of the square to Saturn, all that stuff. Um, and, you know, we had, uh, you know, the, the sort of iconic image from that is the guy dressed like a bull man, right? Like a minotaur. But it began with Mars in Aries, but it was the day of the ingress. And so it just got me thinking about the power of the day of the ingress, um, and, you know, it's like the, the, the sign signification starting that day rather than on the actual ingress. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Um, those were both like very tight correlations of above and below. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I couldn't. Um, one thing people were kind of saying, too, is that, you know, once Venus is no longer besieged, then like there's nothing getting in between Mars and Saturn. Um, and I noticed that like some of like the worst brutality that we were kind of hearing about in the news in Bucha was kind of culminating like right around that, the, those like couple of days right around that conjunction. Right. They were finding some like mass graves and different things like that. Oh, okay. Was yeah. that, that was the timing of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't have much additional take on the Ukraine situation astrologically right now. So yeah, um, but yeah, those are good correlations to note. And then um, I know we had mentioned or we talked about in our pre-show chat that there's been some additional unionization stuff and we're continuing to see some additional waves of pushes for unionization in different parts of, of the US at this point that's coinciding with the Saturn Uranus square that we talked about last year and, and this year, as well as a little bit uh, stuff. I think you had a point about the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction being tied to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually did a little bit of um, mundane predictions for New York City. Um, and I said that like in April, you know, the Pisces pileup kind of looks like unexpected coalitions forming or like a mood of celebration amongst laborers, amongst workers. And so I kind of couldn't help but notice, you know, that Amazon union was in Staten Island. Um, and so that seemed that seemed kind of on point. No, that's a really good that's a really good take. The um like the, the those benefics in Pisces with Neptune have a huge ability to create um, uh, uh, to coalesce, um, I was going to say solidarity, but I'm going to use liquid metaphors, like, um, to gel, um, people with shared interests, right. For a union to gel, um, for things to come together, to coagulate. Um, that's, that's, that's really good. And I think that, uh, I like that because so many of the Jupiter Neptune takes, it's very difficult to not end up being a space cadet, right? Or, you know, going too far off of, you know, literal things like, you know, co a coalition forming um, is a much more concrete thing than, I don't know, some sort of um, vague predictions about enlightenment or having a really wild revelation or experience or dream. I mean, that happens too, but. I mean, I think it's just maybe the nat nature of Jupiter and Neptune is that you can't really describe it concretely. All the time. Yeah, yeah, especially with Neptune. I remember um, uh, some w in my early days of just teaching basic astrology classes, uh, I started noticing that every time I would do the, okay, so here's Neptune, I would end up just totally spacing out and losing my, um, losing my, my, my train of thought. Or sometimes I'd, I'd kind of stumble on really wild metaphors that I hadn't planned on. Um, but I was like, oh, that's, yeah, you know, you're, you enter the planet sphere by like really trying to understand it and convey that understanding. And I just, I was like, okay, you know, whatever I, uh, whenever I attempt to delineate Neptune, just, you know, be ready to be dragged under the waves. Right. Um, let's see, other stuff in recent news. Uh, Steph, I know you mentioned the Elon Musk just bought Twitter successfully literally in the past, what, day or 24 hours under this big pileup in Pisces, which um, I thought was kind of interesting because we have the chart of the very first tweet on Twitter, which in some ways might be the birth of Twitter in a sense. And um, it has Gemini rising and Pisces as the 10th whole sign house, which is kind of fascinating that we had this pile mm -hmm. up of like five planets in the past few days and all of a sudden it is basically owned by new management and and that's where you would look for that which is the 10th house like who, yeah that's great 
I mean, that, that's a that's a really tight correlation, right? Like you see 10,000 is who's who's calling the shots, right? It's the, the, the government. Uh, if it's a nation state, it's who's the boss. If it's a corporation, um, it's uh, in fight charts. It's who's the champion. Right. Yeah, uh, we unfortunately we don't have a birth time for Elon Musk um, still, but yeah, it's otherwise interesting, and we'll see how that goes and whether it ends up being a terrible thing uh, or a good thing. You know, we'll, good, bad, we'll and other. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Anything else about that that you meant to mention, stuff? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say like I had kind of like a deep cut take on that because I was looking at the timeline because there was, um, there was a lot of like just back and forth, like, will, will he, or won't he? Um, and at one point, uh, Twitter's board of investors tried to deploy a poison pill strategy to devalue his share of the stock. And it turned out that the actual like official SEC filing of that motion took place, um, right. Like when the moon was in Scorpio conjunct the South node. And I just thought that was such a, like, you know, South Node and Scorpio trying to kind of like pull and push against, you know, Rahu and Taurus. No, I, I think that's so good. You know, the in older material and in Vedic material, um, poison is one of the themes that's um, very important for both of the nodes. And it's actually, you find it in, uh, God, um, I want to say Mashallah. But um, it's that sort of uh, uh, that era of astrology um, where the dragon's tail um, is characterized as being uh, as having a stinger, which I always I, I've, I've, I don't know. It's an image and an idea that I've been vibing on for D&D nerds. Right. Like that's a, a wyvern. Right. Which is like a, kind of like a dragon, except it's only got two legs and it has a stingy tail. Um, but just thinking of thinking of dragons, right, which we're going to definitely be doing this month with the eclipses. Right. Uh, the, the sun and the moon with the head and the tail. I'm um, thinking of the, the danger of both the head and the tail. Right. Or the mouth and the tail. Right. The dragon dragon breathes fire, noxious fumes, lightning, whatever. Um, but then, you know, it's like, well, what does the tail do? The tail slaps, the tail sweeps. Um, but adding the idea of a stinger, um, I, I, I think brings a greater richness there. And it shows you like, you know, that there's a, there's a hidden danger or intoxication with the tail as well as the, uh, the head. That's funny that you said the tail slaps. Cause one of the people, Live people in our audience earlier, when the Will Smith thing came up, noticed pointed out that the South Node is transiting his moon at the same oh, time wow. as well in Scorpio. Okay. Good catch. <laughs> Not to keep like dredging this up over and over again, but it just made me, made me laugh. That's funny. I yeah, I, I I wasn't intending that. Yeah, well, we'll have to add that to the list of of things of things we learned today. Um, all right, and here's the chart for. Um, Twitter on the inside and just those transits yesterday when the news came out that Elon had bought Twitter um, and just that pile up of, of stuff in Pisces of the moon, Mars, Venus, Neptune, and Jupiter all up there in so, the 10th whole sign house. One quick observation. So the moon was on the part of fortune for um, for Twitter, right? And part of fortune is super important for all all material bodily things like who's you know who who commands the well and the health right if we're looking at a natal chart um looking at like releasing from fortune right like who's who's in charge of the body or you know what is the um yeah anyway I, I, that's that's interesting and mars on the natal uranus or coming up on the natal uranus and you know mars uranus combos um spur quick change and here in the tenth house of um, leadership or executive direction, right? I still can't get over Mercury and Pisces being the chart ruler. Right, it's of Twitter. Of the and it, I mean, doesn't that make like, perfect sense? Retrograde maybe, and conjunct yeah. Uranus. Retrograde conjunct Uranus and squaring Mars, which is conjunct the degree of the ascendant to Gemini. Yeah. I mean, what says people popping off with bad spelling better than that? <laughs> yeah, or or Twitter mobs have become like a famous thing, and that's also sort of a thing and it's interesting seeing that there in that chart in a sort of explosive way but then again like with the last chart we're looking at there's like a 
dueling indications because it also has a pretty nice trine from Jupiter at 18 degrees of Scorpio trining that Mercury, which is helping to probably stabilize it and at least make it successful, even if it right. can be kind of a tough place to to be sometimes. And the ruler of the 10th is getting a transit from the south node. Mm. That's mm. that's wild. I hadn't really looked at this. Yeah. We'll well, looking at that. this and now I'm just kind of wondering like what's going to happen during that Mars retrograde in Gemini Ooh, this fall. Yeah, good call. Right. Yeah, I think um, someone in the chat, Alyssa, mentioned that, that Mars is going to go retrograde in Gemini in the entire second half of 2022. And so the first be... couple months of, yeah, it's still in Gemini for the first couple months of 2023. So yeah. it's it's a big Mars return for, uh, for, <laughs> for Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Right. I didn't really notice this, but it's it's also a Gemini rising chart, just like the Will Smith chart, which means that the midheaven in this chart is also around the same degrees, which is 21 Aquarius. So Saturn's also hovering around that at this point. But if this time is correct, this is a day chart, whereas Will Smith had a night chart, which can make Saturn transits more tricky. Anyway, so that is the Twitter news. Um, Let's see, other news we need to touch on. Um, COVID, the only thing there is just everything is just like opened up across the board, across the country, in the US at least. Um, the mask mandate was dropped unexpectedly on airplanes, I think, for the first time since the pandemic started, which is pretty notable. So we got some of the Jupiter in Pisces, Jupiter Neptune conjunction stuff that we were expecting. Um, jury is still out about the Mars Saturn conjunction because there were two scenarios for that, and we don't know which one is true yet. Which is the last couple of times there have been hard Mars Saturn aspects. There's been a new variant that came out like a few weeks later and then became a big thing. And then, for example, in November, we found out that that variant was first identified around the time of the Mars Saturn square. So, one of the things we were waiting on was to see if the Mars Saturn conjunction in Aquarius, if there would be a new variant that came out at that time. Um, it's been a few weeks at this point, so I don't know what the deal is with that or if that's happening. Or alternatively, the other scenario was the more optimistic and hopeful one that I was hoping for was that Mars-Saturn conjunction was the first one since the beginning of the pandemic in March, April 2020. So in some ways, it was kind of like the end of a cycle. And I was hoping maybe that would indicate the end of like this past two years of difficultness. And while obviously it's not completely the end because it's also the opening of a new cycle and there's going to be new challenges that come up during the course of that. Um, you know, Hopefully the worst of that last cycle that we experienced over the past two years is over. But you know, we, we in the year ahead forecast, we were kind of nervous about the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction because we knew that would probably indicate everybody was feeling pretty good and there's a lot of like optimism and hope and about things going back to normal and being good again. But the question is still with Neptune being so prominent, to what extent is that hope not fully, you know, level uh, realistic or not fully grounded in reality as much as people might think at the time? And that's the sort of open question that we'll have to see over the course of the next month or two. Yeah, right. That that Mars Saturn is a as a, a a sort of new moon for you know the the ills that afflict humankind. Right. And it's very clear that war and famine are in. And the question is, is plague out uh, or is plague also going to stay? Mm, yeah. Mars, Saturn, fashion styles. Well, one thing I also kind of noticed is that, um, you know, in Shanghai, like in China, they're like, you know, undergoing like severe lockdowns again. Um, and so even though that's not really happening all over the world, we're kind of seeing how, you know, at a at another conjunction of Mars and Saturn, there's lockdowns, but then this time it's um, it's kind of interfacing with everything else that's kind of going on right now with um, Jupiter, Neptune being about inflation and then the Saturn Uranus square is having to do with like the supply chain issues. Um, and so just how like there's a lot of like, um, I guess like cargo ships that are just kind of waiting right now. Right. I think there was a picture that was circulating around Twitter about that of just like tons and tons of cargo ships and other ships being sort of stuck in ports around Shanghai um, due to the like extreme lockdowns and stuff. And then we were talking about that as possibly being connected to some of the Uranus and Taurus stuff and disruptions in um, trade and in uh, the transfer of goods and different things like yeah, that. I think it's a hundred percent. It's so the new, so Uranus and Taurus is, 
still doing what it's been doing for years. But um, <clears throat> now we have um, the dragon's head on it. We have Rahu on Uranus and Taurus, and we're about to get a big dose of that um, here just in a few days with the first solar eclipse in Taurus. Um, and, you know, one um, one useful simplification of what the North Node does um, is it injects a planet that it's with um, with uh, performance enhancing supplements that are bad in the long term, but make the planet extremely overactive um, in the short term. And so, yeah, all of the like, um, so, um, you know, Uranus and Taurus, you know, in that square of Saturn has been, has been doing labor movement, right. And that's gotten to a whole new level with the Amazon, um, the sort of move towards, uh, Amazon unionization, uh, Uranus and Taurus has been big on, um, disrupting logistics. That's, you know, with with a war on now, uh, with another big war on, um, that's already uh, um, uh, up another level. Um, with um, import, you know, huge important cities like Shanghai um, shut down. That's also um, amplifying the logistics thing, and then also with Uranus, um, Uranus and Taurus um, disrupting food in particular. Right. We have um, Russia and Ukraine as massive exporters of wheat, um, you know, them, uh, the, the situation as it is being a massive disruption to the world wheat supply, as well as being especially Russia being um, a massive um, exporter of both fertilizers and the necessary uh, materials that go into fertilizers, which means that we're looking at not only the, you know, the, the upcoming, how should we say, harvest um, being disrupted in its distribution, but like the next harvest and maybe the next harvest, because there's so many places that are deeply reliant on fertilizer to make the soil rich enough to grow. Right. And, you know, it, it's uh, Kate and I were talking about this the other day and I, she summarized the like kind of food logistics concern um, with Uranus and Taurus really well as like, hold, hey, where's lunch? Like what happened to dinner? Um, and that's, you know, that's uh, an appropriately grounded Taurian mode of speech, I think. And it's really important. Right. Um, there's there's somebody. I forget who uh, there, there's a, a, a notable quote that says, like, all civilizations are nine meals away from um, pure anarchy. And they meant anarchy in the, the violent form, not the cooperative, collaborative anarchy. But, you know, people miss meals for a few days and every, you know, that there's no society on Earth that's immune to that. Which, you know, and what is that kind of revolt? Well, that's Uranus, too. Right. It's, you know, Uranus bringing about Uranus moments through Taurus things. Yeah. And and that's something we're definitely going to talk about more uh, later in this episode because of the eclipse is really amplifying that Uranus this month. Um, so we'll bookmark that and we'll come back to that later. Um, one other piece of news I wanted to mention because I have an interesting astrological anecdote about it is that Demetra George's book, uh, volume two of her two part series titled Ancient Astrology and Theory and Practice, A Manual of Traditional Techniques, just came out a few days ago on April 20th and was released after a very long writing process, um, really that started back in 2002 when she first started seriously learning Hellenistic astrology. But in some ways, uh, in a podcast episode I recorded with Demetra that I just released late last night about the book, we recorded that um, the day the book was released, and I noticed, I knew that about 30 years earlier, within a month, that there was a United Astrology Conference, which was like a huge astrology conference in 1992 in Washington, D.C., and that it was um, there that Robert Schmidt and Robert Hand and Robert Zoller met up and started having some of the first conversations that led to the founding of Project Hindsight. Um, but what I didn't know is afterwards, a listener, Ronnie Gale Dreyer, wrote me and said um, it wasn't actually in May of that year. It was actually like April on the almost exact same dates that you recorded that interview and that um, Demetra released the book like April 20th, 1992. So she ended up releasing this book exactly 30 years to the date almost of the first conversations that led to Project Hindsight, which 
then led to the translation project where all of these ancient texts were, were translated and then eventually to the revival of Hellenistic astrology over the past 30 years. So I thought that was a really cool correlation and little astrological anecdote about what a Saturn cycle can be like and the ending of one initial phase of the traditional revival and moving into whatever the next 30 years look like in terms of that. It's a pretty good Saturn return. Yeah, it's pretty constructive. Pretty Saturn in Aquarius um, is the Saturn placement itself. So yeah, um, Saturn returns, I'm always always a big fan of seeing how those work out in different ways for people or in this instance, sometimes things or movements or events or what have you. All right, so I think that's it for news and announcements and, and recap of things that have happened over the past month. Shall we transition at this point into looking at the forecast for May? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So I forgot to show the planetary alignments calendar at the very beginning of this episode, but here it is for May. Uh, one of the things you need to know about, because we bumped it from talking about it last month to this episode, is that the very first thing we're going to talk about is the solar eclipse that's happening in Taurus on April 30th because that's really tied into basically a pair of eclipses, which is first that Taurus eclipse, and then two weeks later, a lunar eclipse in the sign of Scorpio on the 16th of May. So we'll spend a lot of time focusing on that this month because eclipse season is always a big deal, and this is the first set that's fully in the signs of Taurus and Scorpio. Um, other than that, Venus moves into Aries on the 2nd of May. There's a Jupiter-Pluto sextile on the 3rd, Mercury slows down and stations retrograde in Gemini on the 10th, and the same day Jupiter leaves from Pisces, which it spent not enough time in and moves into the sign of Aries. Then the Sun goes into Gemini on the 20th, the Sun conjoins Mercury on the 21st, Mercury retrogrades back into Taurus on the 22nd, Mars goes into Aries on the 24th, Venus into Taurus on the 28th, and then finally there is a new Moon in Gemini on the 30th of May. So those are the main things that we're going to be talking about today. And let's see, here's one more diagram for those watching the video version that shows all of those planetary movements through the signs just depicted on a circular wheel chart in terms of where they will start at the beginning of the month versus where they will get by the end of the month. So um, where to start? Shall we start with eclipses and eclipse season? I think we should. All right. How can we not? <laughs> yeah, that is the looming thing in the room is those two major eclipses, especially for people like myself that have things in Scorpio or Taurus. Like That's going to be the big thing this month, I think, is the opening of the full series of eclipses in those signs, because we got a little bit of a preview, preview of it last November when there was a, a lunar eclipse in the sign of Taurus. So there's a little like inkling of it, and some events did start for some people in that sector of their life that coincides with Taurus. But now we're going to get the other side of that, which is that anytime you know eclipses start happening in one sign, they kind of bounce back and forth between the opposite sign for a period of like a year and a half or so. So here's a diagram that shows the dates of those for lunar eclipses this year, and it's just all Taurus and Scorpio. Uh, in six month segments. And I think we discovered yesterday that this series actually lasts for quite a bit longer than you would expect, where there's still some Taurus or Scorpio eclipses taking place all the way into like late 2023, right? Yeah, the um into November, October. The both of the both of the sets of eclipses uh next year in 2023 are sort of halvesies where it's one foot in the Aries Libra axis and one foot in the Taurus Scorpio. And so they're they're, you know, they're mixed. Usually you have one set of eclipses that's transitional like that, but in the case of next year we've got two that are transitional. Okay. Um so It's not over till it's over. Yeah. It's not over until the very last bit of that. So that's going to be extended eclipse. Um, where should we start in terms of that? We start with the Taurus eclipse on the 30th of this month. And that, let me put the chart up for that because it's actually kind of important what things it is configured to in terms of the nature of the eclipse and some of the things that will be happening during that time. So 
There's the Taurus eclipse at 10 degrees of Taurus on April 30th. Um, all the astrologers immediately have noticed and commented on the fact that this is happening simultaneously the same day as the Venus-Jupiter conjunction is going exact at 27 degrees of Pisces, which I think is, is somewhat positive, counter, counteracting or counterbalancing influence. At the same time, the Sun-Moon conjunction there at 10 Taurus is very closely conjunct Uranus at 14 degrees of Taurus, which seems like it's really amplifying that transit of Uranus, which has already been going through that sign of Taurus for several years now and shaking things up. But now all of a sudden, um, it's going to get supercharged this month as we get eclipses taking place there very close by degree. Yeah, I think the um, there are um, there are there are a couple different angles you could look at this from. One, uh, you know, the the simplest and probably the one to start with is just it's conjunct Uranus and Taurus, right? So, you know, even a normal new moon that uh, that close to Uranus and Taurus would just amplify the same significations we've been seeing with Uranus and Taurus, Uranus and Taurus right? Like logistics disruption. Um, the food stuff, um, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, labor, um, you know, like these, these ongoing fixed stories. Um, and then, you know, I, I, as you point out the, it's, uh, it's occurring at the same day as the Venus Jupiter conjunction and Venus is the ruler of Taurus. So we're looking to Venus as the, you know, the, uh, lady of the lunation. And um, also worth noting is that the lunar eclipse at 10 Taurus is in a very tight, its tightest aspect by degree technically is a sextile to Mars. Um, and so there's a lot going on there. And it's the first solar in the Tor it's the first solar in Taurus in the Taurus Scorpio series. Right. Yeah, so it was a lunar eclipse last November, and this is the first new moon solar eclipse in Taurus. So, uh, what what's your take, or how are you feeling about this this eclipse stuff? Um, well, I guess Austin and I were kind of split between like it's a good thing versus it's a bad thing, or maybe not quite. But um, I don't know. I mean, I guess my take on it is that you know, like the Venus Jupiter conjunction um, isn't. I guess because Venus is ruling the eclipse, and because they witness each other by aspect, that it is kind of describing the nature of the disruption in some way. Um, and so, you know, exalted Venus, Jupiter and domicile at the degree of Venus's exaltation is almost kind of like classically as good as it gets. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, eclipses being by their nature kind of malefic or disruptive that um, it makes me think of how sometimes getting what you want can actually be kind of distressing or um I guess upsetting to your nervous system. You know, I think a, a really extreme example of that is when someone wins the lottery and it ends up somehow being like the worst thing that ever happened to them. And I, obviously I don't think that like that's going to describe, um, you know, most people's experiences, but, um, I do. Yeah, I do think it, it is kind of that sort of situation, right. Where, um, sometimes having a good thing happen, um, can feel kind of upsetting to your, I guess, you know, if you have like an identity around, like things don't work out for me, or, um, this is just kind of how my life goes. Okay. It, it could... Yeah. Sorry. I, I like that as sort of, um, with the Uranus, like interfering with a narrative that is not benefic enough. Right. And that interference in and of itself could be disruptive or unpleasant or whatever, um, at the time. Um, but it might be something that's useful that, that it's ultimately useful that it gets disrupted or, you know, um, bathed in dragon fire. Yeah, but I, I definitely think you're right in terms of um, alignments and in terms of looking at whatever alignments are happening in this chart. If there's going to be a softer or more constructive or positive eclipse in terms of it hitting transiting planets in your chart or just as a general chart itself, then this is kind of as close as you can get having a, a eclipse in the sign of Taurus ruled by Venus and having Venus conjoining Jupiter at the same time. So in eclipses, my keyword is always that they represent major beginnings and major endings, usually in the house that they fall or the houses that they fall as eclipse pairs. So just thinking about a major beginning or a major ending 
taking place in that sector of your life over the course of the next month, although as part of a sequence of events that will happen in these six-month increments. Um, but for some people, uh, yeah, I think it could be positive for them um, with that Venus-Jupiter conjunction happening so closely at the same time. Yeah, I, so I would um, I look at them less as beginnings and endings. <clears throat> the um, like there's there is a particular sort of art narrative arc for the the series of eclipses in a given set of signs, right? There's like a year and a half ish storyline usually, but generally, I see um, eclipses as how should we say um, disorienting and some wrenching shifts in that particular area. And it can ultimately be a shift for the more positive or the more negative. But even if it's positive, it comes out of nowhere or uh, requires change more quickly than we can keep up with. Right. You know, you think of like, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, there, there's a certain like roller coaster sort of whoa, to the drops and rises. That's challenging even when it's positive. Um, you know, it's its own, the, that nodal dragon gear is its own kind of, as we say, it's, you know, it's its own kind of ride. It's not um, walking across, um, walking across a flat plane. Um, and then as far as that configuration uh, to the Venus, right? Um, another way that I can see it working out is that um, it's kind of fucking up. Uh, what should otherwise be a perfect moment for Venus, right? That there's one, it's like, you know, everything's going great, it, except there's this one thing that happens, right? It has the ability, it's in one of uh, Venus's two domains. And so even though things are going really well for Venus overall, it's not affecting what's happening in Pisces or Libra, right? But there's a like, you know, there's a wrenching shift in Taurus that doesn't quite accord with the completely exalted and conjunct Jupiterness. Hmm. Yeah, one of the things you said at one point in a tweet, Steph, was that eclipses can create quantum leaps that land us in new places. And I thought that was a yes. really good way to frame it sometimes, yeah. or how, how I see eclipses as well. Yeah, I like I like that language. And also just like sometimes like when I talk to my clients, I describe it as like flipping the circuit breakers on and off again. You know, you're kind of just like disrupting whatever that um, flow of energy was and just kind of... Um, kind of just yeah like it's it's starting the electric impulse from a new place i guess that's interesting I, i've seen a lot of power outages around eclipses that's uh, i think often literally true as well yeah so like kind of like a reset um i like that and we for those that are curious about this I actually did an episode episode 215 was a workshop that lisa scheim and i did about in front of a live audience of how to interpret transiting eclipses based on what houses they fall in in your birth chart. And we took um, examples from an audience just to hear some actual stories of how certain eclipse series had worked out when they fell in pairs of houses in different people's charts. So people can check that out just by Googling like the astrology podcast, interpreting solar and lunar eclipses in your birth chart, and then you should find that episode. Um, all right, so that's the first eclipse, and I know it occurs later in the month, but should we also mention this together with the other half of that, which is the Scorpio eclipse that occurs two weeks later? Yeah, I think so. All right, um, Steph, you had a really good analogy for, for that one for the Scorpio eclipse, I think, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, just to kind of lay out the basics, we have the South Node eclipse um, squaring Saturn pretty close to the degree. And then um, the ruler Mars is conjunct Neptune and Pisces. Um, and so all together, like I was looking at that and I was just kind of looking, thinking that this just kind of looks like sacrifice of some kind or loss of some kind. And just kind of having to, um, you know, thinking about like what your Scorpio house and what are the, whatever those topics may be. Um, I think it's probably likely that that's an area of your life where you try to exert a lot of control or you are just kind of like, um, it's not, it's not an area where you are necessarily easy going, like easy come, easy go. Um, and so that the nature of that, like, you know, losing control and just like allowing something that you might have been, um, kind of like, I guess having a strong attachment to, like, you just have to leave something behind in order to keep going. Um, 
And some of that might be intangible too, um, because I was kind of thinking about what the South Node in Scorpio might mean for people. And it's almost kind of like letting go of the forever war you've been waging in your mind because you just rather do something that makes you feel good instead. Like that's the North Node in Taurus. Hmm. Yeah, so it's maybe tying it back to that be careful what you wish for component that you were talking about with the Taurus eclipse um, earlier in the month or two weeks before this. And here it's maybe a little bit of what you have to give up perhaps um, to make up for the things that you're gaining under the previous eclipse. One of the metaphors I've used for a long time with uh, paired eclipses like this is transits um, is that you have two hands. And if you want to grab onto something with both hands, North, North Node, right? If you want to attach, um, if you want to mm, possess, um, you know, have, then um, you have to let go of something else, uh, South Node, um, if you want to use both hands, right? If you want to hold on to the South Node thing, then that occupies one of your two hands, right? You have two hands and they can, <laughs> they can only be allocated so many ways. Um, and so often, yeah, there's a light, like the necessity of if you want the North Node thing, um, then you may have to let go of uh, some of the South Node thing. But the, um, that, Saturn, um, that Saturn aspect is pretty rough on this one. I, I think this is not going to be, I don't think, I think a lot of people will not experience this as a sort of gentle releasing. Um, you know, the combination of Saturn and the South Node on the moon, um, while the moon is in its fall, makes me think of um, like deprivation, right? Which is a, a state of not having, um, you know, a, a, of not, not being able to grasp the thing that you, you want or need or think you need. Um, but it's a more sort of extreme Saturnian version of that. It just seems like a heart, like putting your body through a harsh detox of some kind. Like, I don't know about you guys, but like every transiting Scorpio moon since the South Node moved in there has just been so feral and raw. And I've been noticing people kind of commenting about that. And it's almost like, you know, I didn't didn't feel that way when, you know, the South Node was in Sagittarius necessarily. So, that you know, like having the combination of the South Node and a fallen moon is just a lot. Um, it's almost like the extent of like, the detox is um, so strong that we only can we can only microdose it like for a couple of days each month. Yeah, the um, I, I, I see the with the, the the South Node and the you know when the body lets go, right? That uh, well, Chris might have done some of that last night, um, right? You know when the body lets go of the expels poisons, right, or what it regards as poison. Um, it's generally not a great night, um, and. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a real thing. And I, Too soon. I, I often see South Node, or I often see with South Node lunar eclipses, um, people are, you know, people have diarrhea stories. There's indigestion stories. Like, it's a thing. Um, and it's true, like, in terms of, like, psychic poisons as well as material ones. But, like, that's a big theme. Mm, yeah, and, and just with the square with Saturn, we're getting a theme of, of negation, of something has to be negated um, from that, because that's one of the Saturn's primary roles um, is to say no to something. And sometimes it can be that scenario of, in the long term, you know, closing Saturn closes one door, which then opens up another, you know, sometime later on. But in the immediate immediacy of that experience, the negation is often not viewed or experienced as a super fun thing. Yeah. This might be kind of a gross story, but um, feel free to cut this later. But um, I, I know um, a Scorpio rising who recently was talking about how he like found the idea of like getting a colonoscopy really appealing. He's like, yeah, man, like that would be so great just to like get cleaned out. You know, like I feel like I'd feel amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> I mean that's the part of the that's the part of the region of the body that Scorpio rules. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I've seen Scorpio risings recently just be interested in kind of like cleaning up their act in terms of like diet and exercise, just wanting to you know run run cleaner. Which is you know one the, the, the reminds me of just one general point about 
sort of the nodes transiting uh, two areas of the life for a year and a half versus like the moment of eclipses um, is that you'll see, you know, you'll see these these changes, the sort of letting go, cleaning up one area, um, doubling down, getting down and dirty um, in the opposite area. Um, you know, from a, from that year and a half long perspective, it's often relatively not gentle, but like doable. Um, but it's all, often the the moments of eclipses themselves in the surrounding days um, bring that like that sort of that somewhat latent current of change to the surface with such immediacy um, and intensity that it's often overwhelming and somewhat incapacitating. And it's part of a larger process that isn't necessarily overwhelming or incapacitating, but it's like, you know, all of um, everything that's been stored up is released um, out into the visible world. The invisible becomes or overwhelms the visible uh, around those eclipse moments. Mm. Yeah. And with this one in particular, in terms of configurations, it's uh, the first eclipse in Taurus is more closely configured to Uranus through that conjunction within three or four degrees, but then the second one is closely square Saturn. So in some ways, it's actually reactivating or reconnecting the Saturn-Uranus square, which is already um, in some instances disrupting or causing tensions between maintaining the status quo versus um, throwing off the status quo and going in a new direction with Uranus and Taurus um, in those sectors of a person's life. And I think these eclipses are really going to bring back some of those those feelings that may have been suppressed last year when we had the exact uh, Saturn Uranus squares going exact over the course of 2021. Mm -hmm. But in some instances, people may have been su uh, successful in maybe suppressing some of that but once eclipses come along and start taking place in those those same signs, it's kind of hard to ignore some of those energies and, and hard not to move in some of the directions that they've been uh, sort of asking you to go up to that point. Yeah. Um, another way to get to a similar place is in looking at the Saturn-Uranus squares, right, and this tension between, how should we say, um, normalcy and security with Saturn um, and um, uh, how should we say rebellion and, and um, freedom seeking um, and disruption with Uranus um, you know the the two were how should we say similarly matched but Saturn's in the superior position but now we've got Uranus and the dragon versus Saturn right so if we're looking at it from a contest point of view um, now it's two on one. Um, it's two in an inferior position versus one with the high ground, but that's the, how should we say, the dynamics, the odds, the betting odds would change at that point. And that's where we're at for the next year. Also, just having the advantage of unpredictability with Uranus in the North Node, right? Right. Double, double unpredictability. Yeah. So, and that's going to be a recurring theme because we've got another, there's like a Taurus lunar eclipse later this year in November mm -hmm. that's going to be. I think it very closely conjunct Uranus um, at the time as well. So paying attention to these eclipses is not necessarily being singular isolated events, but oftentimes connected to a broader sequence of events that will happen in people's lives in six month increments that have major bookends or major you know chapter breaks where one chapter starts and another ends, but it's still part of the same overall narrative, I think is really important. and for some people that narrative already started late last November when we had the first eclipse in Taurus, but now with the Scorpio eclipse taking place at the same time, I think we're really going to see the emergence of that narrative in a way that's much more clear and much more obvious and hard to ignore at this point. Yeah, and just one more sort of area to look for this. Um, <clears throat> as I pointed on the yearly and a couple other places, our uh, times, um, the EU chart has um, like a Taurus moon at like 25 or so and Saturn in Aquarius um, and Mars in late Scorpio. And so this set of eclipses nails that. So does the next one, which makes sense, right? The EU is at, um, at a very, you know, at, at, at a point of having to reckon with the situation that it hasn't since its birth. Right. And so that makes sense that there would be stressful transits. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. 
So those are the two eclipses. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we meant to mention in terms of those. Um, Austin, you mentioned like some of the Scorpio rising people, Scorpio or Taurus rising people dealing with if it's falling in the first house, sometimes bodily matters or things that they're focusing on with respect to their body, or in some instances, it can be connected to their sort of spirit or character. So sometimes it can be an internalization process of getting a better sense of oneself or having some internal changes that relate to one's sense of self. And then that gets tied into the opposite eclipse in the other sign because then it falls in their seventh and then they're having some redefining of relating to other people and direct one-on-one -on -one relationships in their life at the same time. Yeah, right. And the, the, the dragon ties those two together. Right. So it's like, oh, if I want to value other people more and focus on them more, oh, that means I have to take some of my attention off of myself or vice versa. Yeah. And, and what's funny about eclipses is there's a tendency in that year and a half or two year period to swing between extremes like a teeter totter where it's like they'll focus on one for a while, um, but then they'll be in balance the other or they'll focus on the other and they'll be in balance. And it's this year and a half process of trying to, to find the correct balance between those two, especially as major changes are taking place in that area of the life or those areas of the life. Um, so, but some of the other axes, axes that maybe we could mention is like the second and eighth house, which can be like your finances versus partner's finances or other people's finances. Are there any other contrasts between second and eighth that you guys have seen come up? Yeah, I've seen a lot of the time with uh, the Rahu side of it in the 8th, people taking on a lot of debt. Yeah, for sure. Uh, south Node in the 8th, a lot of times it's paying back debt or what's owed. Yeah, for, I guess I've been noticing like um, it sort of shifts the locus away from like, you know, it's North Node in the 2nd. I'm going to be focused on making a lot of money this year. Like I'm going to be focused on like, you know, I guess punching a clock and um and with the opposite north node in the eighth, it's kind of like, how can I maybe just like be supported in new ways so that it's not so much about me, like, you know, constantly putting in the 40 or the 50 hours a week. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we had an example like that at the Denver Astrology Group recently in an episode I'm going to release next month where somebody shared a chart example of that, of catching up and, and paying debt, uh, achieving more stability financially. Um, like you're saying, and then also trying to buy a house, so taking out additional debt, but that still be like being like a major turning point for him to be able to get to that point and, and to own like a home. So that's second, eighth house, um, third and ninth. There was another example at the Denver Astrology Group meeting of a woman who, during the early pandemics, when the eclipses started taking place in. Um, in Sag and Gemini, in her third and ninth house, one of the things she ended up doing was having to homeschool her uh, daughter, her like teenage daughter, and um, learning how to teach and communicate. But then also she, because she was also an astrologer, like integrated some astrology into the curriculum of like her daughter learned astrology and teaching her daughter astrology during that time, which was I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, which, which which node was where? Um, it was the I don't know which was where, but it like I can't remember what the rising sign is. I just know it was in the third ninth house axis. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, just thinking of like simple examples. Other ones for third and ninth, maybe the balance between learning versus figuring out how to communicate something that you've learned. Yeah, another one is uh, short and long term goals and tasks. You know, ninth house is very much a quest. The third house is an errand. Sometimes we need to do a little bit less, you know, epic questing and just handle daily business. And sometimes we need to clear away daily business so that we can, you know, get back to the epic quest. Yeah, I think it's um, ninth, ninth house. Sometimes I see it as being about like the, I guess, like the religious or spiritual experience. And the, the third house is just the ritual or the daily praxis that supports it. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. Nice. Um, fourth and tenth, public life versus private life, and your career versus your home and living situation. Um, sometimes major changes at home with the fourth house, or sometimes major changes with your your parents, which are other major fourth house topics. Um, fifth house can be like children versus friends. Fifth house versus eleventh house. What are some other contrasts of fifth versus eleventh that you've seen? 
in uh, creative professionals, uh, I, in the charts of creative professionals, I see a lot of fifth, 11th as what they create fifth and their audience 11th. And so when South Node's in the 11th and North Node's in the 5th, I see people heading away from like being sort of out and on the surface and get, you know, back to the lab. And then the opposite with South Node in the 5th and North Node in the 11th, it's like, oh, I'm finally going to release the project, which will be true for me because Faces will, the second edition of Faces will come out with the South Node in my my 5th and the North Node in my 11th. Um, but I, I've seen that for years with... Uh, uh, clients who work uh, professionally, creatively. You're going to single-handedly kill the black market for that book, which at this point people are so selling like body organs and like lim <laughs> limbs at this point to get a hold of. Um, I've seen, I guess I've seen those eclipses show up as like shifting interests and shifting, um, I guess, because, you know, sometimes the people you associate with have to do with like what you're into. So if you fall out of love with like a passion or a hobby and then like find a different group of people because you don't really like associate with them as much anymore. Mm, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and then finally, sixth and twelfth house, which is a little bit more tricky. Um, uh, it can... I got it. Or I got one. All right. Go ahead. Um, so on a simple level, in terms of which problems you're focused on solving, um, sixth house is like financial and bodily. You're like, the problem is the bills and that my knee hurts, right? Whereas 12th house, um, it's mental health, it's addiction, it's a uh, spiritual crisis. And so like invisible problems and, and, and concrete problems and switching your focus. And you're like, yeah, I've been really working on my mental health and um, haven't really exercised much, right? And, or, you know, my body doesn't do great. My mind feels a lot better, but it's time to switch focus. Or I've been like, you know, I've been so focused on getting fit that I kind of realize I've been covering up massive anxiety by running 10 miles a day, right? Maybe I should just address the anxiety on its own terms. Right, for sure. And it's interesting how, you know, because the eclipses and the, the nodes move backwards, the 12th, 6th house eclipses always come after the 1st house, 7th house set. So it's in some ways can be a continuation for some people of some of the dealing with bodily things, um, themes that already came up during the previous set of eclipses, but sometimes dealing much more directly with acute issues that you've been putting off or not dealing with and needing to address those in order to improve things overall. Um, which, speaking of, like Biden is the one that we're a little nervous about because last November there was that Taurus eclipse uh, in his what was it? He's Scorpio rising, so it was his sixth house. And um, yeah, he that was the time where for that very brief 24-hour window, he went and had that um, procedure done and they put him under anesthesia so that temporarily um, Kamala Harris was, was like president for a brief period of time. And yeah, we always wondered about that, just the fact that that was the first of a series of then eclipses that would be bouncing back and forth between his 6th and 12th over the course of the next year or two. Yeah, he just, the, the chart doesn't have a clean bill of health for some time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so that, and then finally, um, that's also like the people you don't get along with axis traditionally is the, the 6th, 12th house axis, as well as the Sometimes 12th house can be um, ways in which the native undermines themselves or works against their own best interest. So those can be themes to like pay attention to and, and make sure if they're brought to light that are, are addressed. Right. You may need to switch from um, visible and known enemies to uh, paranoid, to searching uh, for unknown or concealed enemies or vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's a pretty good coverage of eclipses. I feel pretty good about that. We're about an hour into this episode. Um, I did want to mention before we move on to the second half of this episode and the rest of the month, our sponsor for this month. Um, so Kira Taborn uh, reached out to me and is in the process of starting and recently started a new project called The 11th House. And The 11th House is actually hosting pretty soon a free summit called the Emerging Astrologers Summit on Saturday, May 21st, 2022, from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific time. So 
Um, this seems like a really cool project because it's a continuation of something she had done previously that was a really great community contribution in helping to highlight or, or spotlight up, up and coming astrologers in the astrological community and different voices in the community. So the description is that the Emerging Astrologers Summit highlights a diverse group of up and coming astrologers in the field who have yet to speak publicly. Um, you can join them for an exciting all-day summit to support and learn from five talented astrologers who are eager to share their work with the world. The summit takes place virtually on Saturday, May 21st between 11 and 8 p.m. Pacific and is completely free to attend. So registrants can access the replays of each of the talks for 24 hours after they've gone live. There's also an option to purchase an all-access pass for unlimited access to the replays from the five lectures which then helps to support the speakers. So the all access pass is $65 up until the day of the summit, and then it raises to $75 after the summit. So you can register for free and attend the talks for completely for free at Kira's website, which is theastrology.com. And then there's a page there that where you'll find um, more information about the 11th house and some of the other things that she's building with it, which are kind of cool, which have to do with building community, um, connecting different astrologers, and um, yeah, like a bunch of really cool stuff that I think is going to be a great project and is a great continuation of what the great work she did previously, um, organizing some other webinars over the course of the past two years that really brought to, to my attention some different astrologers that are doing great work that I'd never heard of or, or hadn't seen or just wasn't familiar with their style yet up until that point. Yeah. yeah, Kira does great work. She also just organizes like the best spaces. Um, you know, if you were lucky to be in New York City before the pandemic, um, she used to organize a lot of dinners for astrologers. Um, so yeah, hundred percent can vouch for any sort of community or group thing that Kira organizes. Well, and it's a nice like first course um, before uh, Norwalk. Right. It's what is it? It's the weekend before Norwalk. Um, and so for people who are doing both, it's like, you know, it's a nice way to begin a solid, I don't know, two weeks of astro astrology download. Yeah. Or alternatively, for people that aren't able to attend Norwalk, to be able to attend a free series of astrology lectures um, is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Um, free is good. Free is very good. Um, I would have so, loved to have a community like this when I was like just getting into astrology. You know, <laughs> I know, right? Like, I feel like we older astrologers are kind of getting robbed of um, all of the amazing things that are available to astrologers just in the past three to five years. Like, this is such an amazing time to come into the field and just have so much available that you can draw on, and so much knowledge and information and wisdom just sort of available at your fingertips to a certain extent. Yeah, the um, it's it's an embarrassment of riches. At the same time, I perversely value my, you know, l like l uh, basically being the only person I knew who even knew astrology was real, and sort of just studying with a pile of charts and a hole in the ground for years. Like that was there are advantages to that form of education, though I wouldn't recommend it, nor would I inflict it on other people. <laughs> But it, there, there were certain Saturnian lessons. Um, but yeah, I, you know, objectively speaking, uh, this is uh, vastly superior to my hole in the ground method. Yeah, my dank yeah, cave um, carry the ephemeris, um, you know, upwards in snow, uphill and and downhill in snow, and things like that. It's true. Yeah. Uh, when did you get into astrology stuff? Um, I would say probably for me, it started like late high school. So, you know, to date myself, that was like 2006. Um, okay. yeah. so I was, you know, I kind of took the, you know, same path. A lot of people take is that like, I saw something that kind of resonated with me and then I got curious and I spent most of my undergrad years just reading about it a lot and like learning about my birth chart and stuff like that. And just kind of, you know, it wasn't like cool or trendy to be into astrology at the time. So I think I got a lot of like weird looks or ridicule. Right. Um, but I had a couple friends who thought it was neat. Um, yeah, the friends that you like read charts for, where you're you're like the astrology person. Okay, yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's a more common experience years ago. Now it's like everybody has some basic knowledge of their sun, moon, and rising, which is just really wild in comparison to you know ten years ago. Yeah, it's um, it's nice to not have to do all the framing 
of like, okay, so this is astrology. No, it's not really. I mean, it's kind of like your, you know, newspaper, but not really. Like there used to be all this extra work you had to do to get to actually looking at the chart with someone. And now people are like, yeah, I'm into astrology. Um, you know, what can you tell me? And so there's like a half an hour of, um, you know, careful work that you don't have to do anymore in, in most cases, which I, I don't, I don't miss that. It's nice to be able to just get right to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, people can check out the, the astrology.com for more information about that. And it should be a great event. And I'm looking forward to seeing other events like that in that series in the future. So why don't we then move into talking about, we've literally on paper only talked about like one thing that's happening astrologically this month. And it turns out that there's like a lot more than just the eclipses happening this month, even though that is certainly, you know, the most important thing. Um, let me pull up the planet. Right, in a sense, we can, we can summarize all of the rest in two statements. One, Mercury retrograde. Two, lots of stuff moves into Aries. Yeah, I was going to say boom as the keyword for that. Uh, Mars for and Aries. Jupiter. Yeah. I think May is like the acceleration month. Mm, like, things speed up. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, just like the kind of like com combined effect of all of those things, just eclipses, uh, Mercury retrograde, stuff going into Aries, you know, it's just kind of, you know, timelines warping and speeding up and it's very roller coaster. Yeah, I like that is speed because that was I did the I finally started my Zodiac series um, where I'm going to do a deep dive, like two hour at least episode into each of the signs of the Zodiac. And we started with Aries with Rick Levine and. Um, that's one of the things I was really thinking about that really not just made a lot of sense, but helped me understand the archetype of Aries better is the notion of speed, like being a core underlying thing and impulse. And that manifests in like so many different ways of like heavy Aries placements, liking to go fast or liking to drive fast or eat um, fast. Yeah. Eat fast. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Or other, other things fast. Like there's many. Um, different ways in which the notion of like speed and just moving faster, and even in like ancient texts, they would say that Mars is a fiery planet and it heats things up and makes them move more quickly. Whereas Saturn is like a cold archetype and it slows things down and grinds things to a halt. So that's a really good keyword as we're moving out of just like years of stuff piling up in Capricorn and Aquarius and just the slowness and the grinding to a halt, sometimes very literally of like the, the pandemic and the lockdowns versus now we're moving into a sign where things start to move much more quickly or much more rapidly. Yeah, um, just to speak to that. So two of the most famous MMA fighters who have Mars and Aries, Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor, um, during their, their sort of championship runs, um, they were just, it was first round finishes all day long, right? Um, the, you know, they, the fights didn't go to decision. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, they weren't slow wars of attrition. Like Rana would just run up, grab people and then break their arm and kind of would just run up and knock people out. Um, and what's interesting. And so this is, so Aries is a cardinal sign. So it's about beginnings. Uh, it's about how do you start energy? Um, and so what's interesting is both of them, uh, obviously had a lot of, uh, how should we say, speedy off the blocks uh, energy and uh, similarly with their careers. But both of them just kind of petered out after what, you know, after championship runs. And so you see that Mars and Aries brilliant sort of first third or opening, um, but then both the careers fell off at what should have been the midpoint rather than the end. Yeah, Aries, it's like a very strong beginning. Um and burst of energy, but not a lot of staying power in the same way that most of the fixed signs have, which is more their role. It, it's a sprint, right? You get tired when you sprint, but you're really fast. Yeah. Er, uh, Rick Levine used a really great point about that, which he said, like, if you're if Aries is playing in a game against somebody, um, they need to like, if you're playing against an Aries, um, the Aries will just like destroy you early on, like right out of the gate. But that the difference between Aries and Scorpio is that 
if Ares doesn't just like completely decimate Scorpio in the beginning, like they're in trouble because the Scorpio will go back and like research things for like the next 10 months and then we'll come back like much stronger because of that staying power. And there was a funny, I had a funny example of that recently with like playing somebody at Mario Kart where they just like demolished me the first time in 20 years and then I had to like research up and like come back, come back stronger to <laughs> avenge myself. That's, you researched so Mario Kart? I'm not going to lie. I did research. I watched <laughs> some of YouTube videos. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of like, it, it got complicated. I was like, yeah, I'll play Mario Kart. I'm sure it's the same as it was like 20 years ago when I was playing Mario Kart 64. But it turns out there's a lot of new tricks. But if you just go on in YouTube and Google like, you know, top 10 tips for how to play Mario Kart, then you, you learn yeah. to drift. Oh man, I got the drift. There's more, but there's also like you can jump off jumps. And if you jump at the same time with the jump, um, you get an extra boost. And there's just all sorts of little little tricks like that. So I had that up in my sleeve so that I I uh, won the rematch. Nice. Uh, so two things really quickly. One, um, you know, in combat sports, um, people who are super strong right out of the gate, they, they talk about if you're facing someone like that, you just need to weather the storm. You don't try to win the first round. You just like stay safe and let them get tired. And two, um, I spent most of my teenage years um, playing Axis and Allies, like a, a you know ten hour World War II board game uh, against a Scorpio Stellium friend of mine. And the the way to defeat the Scorpio is let them. Um, invest deeply in their brilliant long-term plan and then spoil it like two thirds the way through the game. He would get, he, he had great plans, but if I could figure it out and then spoil it, um, he would just literally quit. It, it was literally just letting them do the fixed and then breaking that. All right. I'm never going to play that game with you now that I know your strategy. <laughs> um. Yeah, so so Aries, and the reason why we're talking about all of this is we have both benefics going into the sign of Aries um, this month and really shifting the energy, and then eventually Mars catches up as well. So here's the transits where Venus will move in by the 2nd of May into the sign of Aries, and then shortly after that, only about a week later, Jupiter moves in by May 11th. So then we got this. We get this pretty nice transit of just having both benefics moving through that sign for pretty much the rest of the month. Um, now, eventually, Mars does catch up and sort of crashes the party and returns to its home sign of Aries by the 24th and 25th of May. At which point, we get a little stellium going through that sign, and things become a little bit more tumultuous or get sped up even more and the heat and sort of volume gets turned up on that sign in that sector of our chart. Um, but yeah, that's where a lot of the action is taking place this month is in that sign. Yeah, Those it's... couple of days just look rude. Rude, <laughs> like yeah. Because Mars and the moon both ingress around the same time. And then, um, you know, the moon actually ends up like conjoining Venus right as it's squaring Pluto, like in right. the late degrees of Aries. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I just thought it was interesting how like there's like that sequence and then basically Venus leaves Aries right before Mars and Jupiter perfect. So there's mm -hmm. no longer any sort of Venus to buffer any of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Jupiter's sort of left on his own to deal with Mars. So let's 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 drop back to the timing of these three ingresses because it's really spread pretty widely throughout the month. Right, so Venus's ingress is on the what second? All right, so and part of so part of the story here is planets in Aries, but the other side of it is it's planets not in Pisces, right? Because as the month begins, we've got all these planets in Pisces, you know, doing the lots of Pisces thing that we've been doing for a month, um, and so um, you know, <clears throat> and so it's you know one Venus and then on the second and then two Jupiter on the 10th and then three sort of most emphatically Mars on the 24th. And so this is like a slow, you know, this is planets crawling out of the primordial sea and growing ram's horns, you know, one, two, three throughout the month. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and just Mars being left to its own devices in Pisces, which already there's an interesting shift over the past month when you know, you had both benefics there and things are going relatively well. And it was interesting to see the 
additional co-mixture of Mars when Mars moved into Pisces and all of a sudden things were not as calm or stable or peaceful as they, as they were prior to that? Yeah, it's like it was um, it was just a dream, but then Mars came in and now it's a fever dream. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I liked when, when you mentioned like sound or loudness, maybe you said that stuff, but it was something or it made me think of that, which is I realized um, Aries and, and Mars is Mars in general is just loud. Like that's one of the things that it can do is like loud noises or amplify the volume of things. And it made me remember and think back to some of Vadius Valens' significations of Mars in the second century. And one of the significations he says is screams, um, which is not just that it's not just like a, a morbid thing in terms of screams sort of metaphorically, but also that Mars, especially when it gets connected with things like Mercury, is loud, piercing noises, noises, and the notion of Mars being piercing. And what does that sound like when Mars does something piercing related to sound? It's like something that's really loud that hurts your ears because the volume is just amplified and, and turned all the way up. Yeah, where right. it's a battle cry, it's a ki. Um, it's also if you think of martial scenarios, um, even let's say a productive one where we're looking at like industry and metal and blacksmithing, you have like the clanking of metal on metal, or the clash of swords, or the screech of a blade uh, against a piece of armor. Like they're all piercing sounds. Right. So. Um... Are there any other things? I, I thought there were some other things we meant to mention about Mars and Pisces, or how the two of you have experienced that recently, or things that you you observed or noticed. I mean, I've gotten, um, I've fallen back in love with kicking stuff, right? Although, also injuring yourself a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, that was um, I got, I was overdoing it, and I was uh, my, my footwork was a little too fancy, and I um, my my left. And this is interesting. So I'm in an Aquarius perfection. Aquarius rules basically between the knee and the ankle. Um, you know, Pisces is the feet. Um, and I was I was just overtraining, and I, I did a particular kick. And when I landed on the base leg, um, it felt like the entire left um, left calf like cramped really suddenly, um, and was super tender the rest of the day. That was Friday night, um, and it's almost back to normal now. But it was like coming right up to the edge of a not it wasn't a muscle tear but it was a mild strain which mild but i i was i was literally walking like saturn uh the next day like i had to hold it totally stiff um and i was like mars how could you do me like this and i was like oh it wasn't mars wasn't the feet, right? It was literally Saturn. Um, I'm in an Aquarius perfection. Saturn is there. It was the the calf. And what is Saturn saying is slow down. Like, I'm glad you're excited, but uh, slow down. And I have Mars opposite Saturn natally. So my Mars is perfectly set up to get regulated by uh, and regulate, regulated on by Saturn, but um, almost back to full functionality, but uh, quite, quite the speed bump. I actually have... Um, um, I was um, experimenting with recording things because I have no record of being able to do things. I was like, I don't know, when I'm 80, I might want a, a video. And so I have a video of me doing a kick and then grabbing my leg and going, oh, 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 fuck shit. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. It's what, I, it's what um, I get, apparently. Yeah. So one of the things maybe worth mentioning about Mars and Pisces um, before it departs from there is it is going to catch up um, around the time of one of those eclipses to Neptune. So we're going to get a Mars-Neptune conjunction in the middle of the month around May 17th. So we've talked about this sort of ideal and idealization previously of you know Venus-Neptune or even Jupiter-Neptune. Um, but Mars-Neptune is kind of tricky energy because Mars usually wants to go forward and it wants direct movement and to just quickly get to the point um, sometimes to the point of that that can be experienced externally as like brusqueness or something like that but neptune um, because it has this uh, archetypal quality of making everything less clear can make make the route forward less clear and can um, make you have to go in a more circuitous route than mars is usually comfortable doing so sometimes that can be confusion surrounding actions or even mistaken actions that are made impulsively. 
Yeah, it could be um, um, aggressive deception. <clears throat> it can literally be the the fog of war, right? Yeah, um, that happened you know, last the, last summer. Do you remember that one? Uh, it's ringing a bell. I think it was the Mars Neptune opposition. I want to say. But it was during the U.S. the like chaotic pullout from Afghanistan. They authorized that missile strike. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was like the bombing near the airport, and then the U.S. like freaked out and was on high alert. Or the U.S. military, and then they ended up like doing a missile strike, which they said initially, and they put out the announcement that day saying it was like insurgents or somebody that was going to bomb the airport again. But then later, like a week or two, it came out that. They actually just like killed a bunch of random civilians because they mistakenly thought that it was something that it was not. So when you mentioned the fog of war, it just made me think of that. Yeah, I mean, that's part of um, Mars and Neptune are it's very difficult to they have. um, How should we say it's very easy for Neptune to interfere with Marsing correctly, Um, right? Because if you've got a gun. Um, and you are intent on firing it, it's really important that you know exactly what you're firing at or a missile or whatever, right? Like the, that lack of information when you're dealing with an active malefic, right? Uh, like you don't swing a sword, you don't swing your kitchen knives around randomly in all directions. You just chop the carrots, right? And so that Neptunian fog becomes much more dangerous um, when closely associated with Mars. Thank you for remembering that. I was like, fog of war was tickling my mind, but I couldn't remember um, the incident that was doing the tickling. Yeah, I'm now thinking of like trying to chop carrots with your hands, and then, but like doing it if the what's in front of you, there's just like a fog covering it, and that you know you're gonna chop some carrots, but you're probably gonna cut your hands as well potentially at the same time. Right. So, Steph, you have Mars and Pisces, right? I do. Yeah. What what uh, what na- what observations do you have? You know, uh, mine's mine's at the last degree. So like, yeah, I'm like you, I'm having my Mars return. Um, I don't know if I'm like completely clear on what that's going to be about for me just yet. I'm kind of just waiting and seeing because usually my Mars return and my Mars opposition is like not a good time for me. It's you know I'm a day chart, um, but you know maybe with you know the presence of the benefics there right now, it's kind of helping until they leave. Yeah, right. What are some of your Mars Neptune combination keywords or or metaphors or things that come to mind with that combination? Um, well, like kind of going back to the eclipse, you know, just like sacrifice. You know, I think especially in that third decan of Pisces, like there's just kind of like giving it all. Um, That's a good one. Yeah, because Mars know, think... re- likes to be like courageous, and if you combine that with Neptune, you get that sacrificial quality combined even more of like of being willing to do something for the ideal. Well, like, you know, to kind of go back to what was in the news, like the man who set himself on fire in front of the Supreme Court um, to protest governmental inaction on climate change, you know, I think that really felt very Mars and Pisces to me. Um, But I mean, in terms of the, you know, the conjunction that's coming up, I think one thing that I thought was sort of notable was just that, you know, um, Mars and Pisces has like two sort of distinct chapters where the ruler is at home with Mars in Pisces and then it goes into Aries and then they're not witnessing each other by sign anymore. And so like that conjunction happens with Jupiter and Aries. And so I feel like there's a little bit of like losing the plot a little bit or maybe just kind of like temporarily, um, I guess temporarily like running out of steam in some ways or um, just having like the you know, the Jupiter and Aries part is kind of getting hyped up, but then not really being completely sure how you're getting there until those two planets are together again. Hmm. Right. That makes sense. So there's a little nebulous in between period before the direction forward starts becoming clear again later in the month when Mars moves into Aries. Yeah. With the Neptune. Well, so one way to another sort of angle on it is we have a, you know, Mars is applying to a conjunction with Jupiter for a lot of the time in Pisces, but then Neptune is between the two and, um, you know, and Jupiter changes signs. They'll both change signs before they complete that conjunction. So there's like the feeling of like, you know, the big move, the big victory, the bold, triumphant, whatever, which is Mars, Jupiter energy. 
But um, like you were saying, saying stuff, they, um, there's a Neptune in between and there's a sign change in between. So it's like, so what are, how are we going to, what are we doing mm-hmm. here? And then like, aha, into Aries. Yeah. And the, yeah, the sacrificial thing with just the third deck in a Pisces is full of that kind of symbolism. And Mars is the ruler. And then add Neptune and then add Mars as the ruler of what you called stuff, the um, the the lunar eclipse of sacrifice. <laughs> and there's, you know, there, there's a, as you say, a symbolic solidarity going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something also before we move fully on from Jupiter in Pisces, but um, the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction, a lot of people have commented, a lot of astrologers have commented about the inflation rates and how inflation has just skyrocketed and that being a Jupiter-Neptune thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That was um, sort of the the stock that, that is, as long as I've uh, studied astrology, Jupiter-Neptune on a mundane sense is always the stock answer is inflation um, and correct, right? <laughs> and proven correct. For lots of different reasons, right? It's one of the things I've been noticing is how um, it's it's sometimes easier with astrology to pre- to predict the result than the causes that go into it, right? And that sometimes when we think too much about well, but how could that happen? Um, we will end up fucking up predictions. It's like, oh, why would wheat be so expensive? I, you know. Um, you didn't know that there was going to be um, war with major wheat producers, right? And maybe you couldn't have guessed that, but you right, get or, these. Go, go ahead. Or I was just going to say, like, why would the economy tank in 2020? It seems so great now. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is kind of what we were all saying in that the year ahead forecasts. Um, what was the word that you just used, Austin? It wasn't outcomes, but it was results. The results. So the original word for the study of astrology and, and Ptolemy's original title for his book was apotelismatics, which means the study of outcomes or the study of results. So that was one of the words that was used for astrology back in the day is this notion of studying outcomes or, or results of things and that that's what you could do with astrology potentially. So it's that made me think of that. Yeah, that's nice. And then in a lot of um, the Vedic astrology texts, the, the term that's used is studying the fruit, right? Not it's like okay, there's this plant, there's this tree, it's in this environment, but what is the fruit? You know, what is the nature of what it produces? What is the result, right? Yeah, that makes sense. All right, let's move on to Jupiter and Aries because I know we got a bunch of stuff to talk about there. Um, well, we, let's talk. We didn't say anything about specifically Venus. We'll just say something about like. So Venus and Aries, I see um, the aesthetic focus um, shifts towards like dynamic, um, some of jarring, kinesthetic, like um, the uh, the demonstration and performance of um, ability and power. Right. You know, it's very much like um, the spectacle of individual power. Um, it's not you know, it's not like a gentle sort of universal Venus. Um, you know, it's a. Um, you know, th- there's a, an appreciation for the brash, the loud, um, the, the swift, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Venus and Aries is like sugar and spice, not necessarily everything nice. Like, I think it's very like allergic to people pleasing. Um, and there's kind of like, you know, maybe like a special charm that comes from being a little rough around the edges. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and having the uh, doing something well, but also having an interest and having enjoyment from something that um, people don't otherwise usually concept, conceptualize sometimes is enjoyable, which is a little bit of a theme you get with Venus and Scorpio, especially where it's much more clear and defined, like a love of the Gothic or something like that, which is not seen as mainstream or can be seen as morbid or what have you, but having a, 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 an interest in the aesthetic appeal of that Venus and Aries is some of that, but taking out some of the morbid component or the darker component and instead focusing on you know, the kinetic, the fast, the rough and tumble, um, the athletic and other things like that, um, sides of, of Mars. Uh, yeah, I think in, of it, I think of Aries um, is sort of gladiatorial glory, 
right? It's Marshall, but on full display. It's the sign where the sun is exalted. Let's show, you know, let's see what you can do. Venus and Aries appreciates the perfectly timed strike. Mm. Yeah. One of, Big, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, it could be like showing affection by like playful ribbing or just like, you know, pushing each other's buttons a little bit like play fighting. Totally. Yeah. Right. Bonding through busting balls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of any famous Venus in Aries people. I mean, one of the ones I think of that always comes to mind is um, Robert Downey Jr., who has like a Venus Sun Mercury conjunction in Aries and, um, you know, becoming really famous over the past decade for Iron Man and stuff like that, which is kind of like a brash character that he embodies in some ways. Um, yeah, that's one of the Venus and Aries that comes to mind for me. Do you, either of you have any that you think of? Doesn't Rihanna have Venus and Aries, or am I making that I think up? She has Mars and Aries. Mm. Not sure. I don't. Let me see if I have her birth time. I don't have it saved. Um, yeah. So so Venus and Aries. That's pretty much all month because Venus is just transiting through Aries until the very end of May. And it doesn't leave and move into its home sign of Taurus until the 28th of, of the month. Right. And then on the 10th, we get Jupiter, which is um, on and off for a year. Yeah. It's, a, so it's Jupiter, a pretty major and lasting shift. Right. So um, there was somebody on Twitter recently, Ari from Saltwater Stars on Twitter, that was talking about um, people having a misconception of expecting... Jupiter be, to be in its home sign, being great external goods and like in a sudden windfall of like external things, but instead um, not realizing that with Pisces it can be more of an internal growth or an internalization of things, and that made me think of then you know Aries then switching to an odd sign being perhaps again some sort of externalization of something rather than the internalization that's more common with even signs yeah i think they said um that people are expecting diurnal results instead of nocturnal possibilities from jupiter and pisces which i thought was really beautiful right yeah, that was really brilliant. So Jupiter and Aries, the externalization or the diurnalization of things. You had a funny thing about a TV show that Jupiter and Aries reminded you of. I oh, think. yeah. Um, yeah, this is kind of like my my dumb personal association, um, because when I think of Jupiter and Aries, I think about like everyone who was like in the grade above me in high school and um, just makes me think of like the boys who were like obsessed with emulating jackass when that was a thing. So I don't think that's necessarily like specific to Jupiter and Aries people. I think if you were a high school boy at the time that that was like in the cultural zeitgeist, then you were probably into that on some level. Um, but um, I guess one of the things that did stand out to me, though, is that um, both Johnny Knoxville and Bam Margera have Mars and Jupiter co-present in a fire sign. So maybe not like Jupiter and Aries itself, but once we have Mars and Jupiter together, it's going to be like real kind of jackass energy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, Aries is a risk taker sign. And um, one of the things that Rick Levine and I were talking about on the Aries episode is he said that um, sometimes there can be a penalty for being first. And sometimes that can work out like the first through the the breach or the first to come up with a new idea, which could be innovative, and that can be good um, to be the first. But other times, you know, you can fail, or there can be blowback for being the first to do something to go it go out on your own. Um, but hopefully, with Jupiter here, we're talking about more of the successful side of being first or or being innovative in some way. Yeah, they, um, so another good a good example of being first not being great is being involved in trench warfare, right? Being the first to charge the enemy trench is not a coveted position, right? Whereas being the first to cross the finish line is a is a coveted position. Mm. Mm. It's kind of like, yeah. did you watch Squid Game? Mm -hmm. Where yeah. it was like, they were like, oh, is it a good thing to be first or not? And then it was mm -hmm. like, depending on what the challenge was, it was like, you were either right. setting yourself up for 
Is it a Mars game or a Saturn game? Mm. Yeah, so that's one question people have to ask themselves this month as we move into this Aries energy and things speed up and and that there will be some instances where um, there could be opportunities and benefits or rewards for being the first to do something or, or for charging headlong into something if it's a good idea. Um, but then occasionally sometimes that impulse to just like go and do it from instinct can backfire if your your instincts are, are misfiring for some reason. Yeah. Uh, so another angle on Jupiter that I like to take is, um, so Jupiter is associated with um, teachers and wisdom and the opportunity for growth or improvement in an area. So I always like to ask myself, what is Jupiter, you know, what is Jupiter teaching in this sign? What kind of teacher um, or mentor is Jupiter in a given sign, right? And so in Aries, um, you know, it's the it's the coach, it's the the sensei, the sifu, right? It's you know, like it's the teacher who wants to teach you to be better in action, to endure the rigors of action, to be bold and fearless in the moment, right? It's a it's you know, it, it's a coach for action, right? It's not. Um, you know, teaching uh, transcendental mysteries, right? It's not about, you know, whatever the, the, the mystery of immac pondering, um, you know, a sedentary mystery. It's like, here's, you know, here's what you need to do to perform better, right? And there's that externalization, like Aries is very much in action, right? And that's part of the, the, that's part of how I see the exaltation of the sun. It's like, you know, the sun in Leo is like, I am, you know, I am what I am. But the sun in Aries is like, I will show you what I am. I will prove it through action. And Aries loves, plants in Aries love to prove themselves um, in action in front of people. Yeah, it's almost like gaining wisdom from trial and error. Like you don't know until you do it. Right, right. right. Um, and then also, I think, Steph, you had mentioned that there we have to also pay attention to the Pisces-Aries crossover where there were some maybe some like dreams that came up in the Pisces, but then now there's something else where it's made concrete or the action is taken. Yeah, no, I saw, um, I saw a completely unrelated tweet earlier in the year where someone said, I don't care how unrealistic it is, I'm going to accomplish it in 2022. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that's what Jupiter is basically doing. You know, it's kind of moving away from like the pipe dream to like, let's just go, let's just do it, let's just see what happens. Um, and like, so, you know, it's like, I think moving, yeah, like something that maybe you would have been a little bit too shy or too timid to attempt in like a different environment, this might be the year where you just kind of like do something just to see what happens, even if, you know, there's not like, even if it feels like a stupid decision, like I feel like Jupiter and Aries, there's going to be kind of like a increase in both bravery and stupidity, which is kind of like two sides of the same coin, because, you know, sometimes a willingness to be or look stupid can be beneficial if you are normally the type of person who misses out on things because, you know, you're playing it safe all the time. So like, you know, it's not a guarantee of anything working out, but, um, there is kind of an optimism around just taking the risk and being able to say like, look, at least I tried. Um, and maybe just feeling a little more confident that you'll be able to bounce back if it doesn't go like the way you want it to. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so eventually we have to also bring in our third component that comes up later in the month, which is that Mars joins the party on May 24th, 25th and moves into Aries where Shortly after that, it gets really close and forms a conjunction with Jupiter by the 28th and 29th. So that's a little bit um, of a hard read because there's two possible, possible scenarios for that that I've wondered about. I mean, one of them is Jupiter expands things um, and Mars is sometimes about conflict. So one of the questions is, is that like a heightening of tensions or conflicts or an expansion of conflicts? Um, and of course, like the past few months in terms of geopolitical stuff have been really tense and there's a lot of really crazy stuff going on and a lot of brinkmanship and um, different countries fighting like proxy wars and things like that. So that's one scenario where, for example, everyone was really worried about whether like what 
NATO and what the Western countries would do, and if they would cross that line into doing something that brought them into direct conflict with with Russia. Um, but then the other side of that is, are the benefics to some extent going to help settle down or restrain Mars to some extent? And Jupiter, one of its significations is like like peace and creating accord and stability between people and things. So is a Mars-Jupiter conjunction, on the other hand, then a bit more peaceful and a bit more constructive in bringing sort of the cessation of some sort of conflict, especially with that reception between Mars and Jupiter? Those are two scenarios to think about around the time of that conjunction. Yeah, I think that um, the answer as to do we get Jupiter mellowing Mars down or Mars marshalling Jupiter really depends on the sign location. If Jupiter is stronger, Jupiter is going to mellow Mars. If Mars is stronger, I think um, <clears throat> Jupiter ends up aiding Mars. Um, I, 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 I wish I could say that that looked um, more peaceful than it does to me. Um, it, you know, as far you know, if we're looking at you know an ongoing conflict, which we can't ignore if we're talking about Mars. Um, one thing about Mars and Pisces is it's in a mutable sign. <clears throat> Mutable is adaptive, right? But like you, you see what's going on and then you try to adapt to it, right? Um, uh, Aries is very cardinal or initiatory, um, which in warfare looks like an offensive, right? Like, okay, they're doing this and this, whatever. We're going to do this and make them adapt to us, right? And so that looks, I don't know who's, you know, um, sort of stunning offensive that is, but that looks like a, that looks very offensive to me. Looks like maybe it's Ukraine going on the offensive. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a Russia. Maybe it's a you know another party, whatever. Um, but that's that's pretty straightforward. Um, and I, I don't see how Jupiter can really slow Mars down in Aries like that. Yeah, and one of the things that's really important is this is all taking place within the context of a Mercury retrograde that lasts for the entire th last three weeks of the month, and Mercury actually stations retrograde the same day that Jupiter goes into Aries. So there's something about that element as well because of the potential for, for miscommunications or crossed wires or things like that um, at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so one of the things um, I just think you know worth noting in terms of the general tenor of the month is um, Mercury retrogrades. You know, it makes things more confusing, right? Um, things don't get delivered on time. You thought the appointment was eleven. The person you were meeting thought it was one because they wrote it down wrong, and the meeting doesn't happen as scheduled. So you add that to the generally somewhat disorienting. Um, quality of the eclipses, um, and there's a lot of um, there's there's the potential for a lot of confusion or seeing things um, not very clearly. Like things are moving fast, but the the field of vision, the visibility, isn't good. Yeah, what are some of your Mercury retrograde keyword stuff? Um, I think of it as just kind of like you know, like your, your mind computer is kind of like defragmenting or just kind of like making space for new information by like reconfiguring things a little bit. Um, so, you know, like review recalibration, um, um, I guess reflection, all the rewards. Yeah. I like that. That's a really good. Yeah. And so let, let me tie that into the, some of the, the Aries stuff, right? So we have this like, you know, boldness boost, right? Which starts on the day of the Mercury retrograde um, because Jupiter moves into Aries the same day. And then we have Mars moving into Aries uh, two weeks later while Mercury is still very retrograde. Um, and so, you know, you may, the, the spirit may be with you, but maybe wait until, you know, you can see where you're going before you um, charge headlong into whatever fray. Right. I don't you think that's what people are going to do, though. <laughs> right. right. Well, except for the listeners yeah. of this podcast right. who are going to right. contemplate this and wisely time their actions. Yeah. Like my buying a sandwich under moon Mars conjunction last night. Um, yeah. But sometimes you're very rash of you, Chris. Right. So, so a brashness, but it's like sometimes with Mercury retrogrades, you have to do, you have to fail. Like you have to 
make the first step, but then you learn from it, and that becomes the process of the th three week retrograde period is making the mistake, but then learning from it and going back and having a do over and trying again. So, 100% also counterpoint. A lot of times people feel like things have to happen now during a Mercury retrograde, and they absolutely don't. And it would be way easier if you just delayed it two weeks and got it right the first time. Um, Same yeah. with eclipses, Both honestly. Are true, though. Yeah. Mm. Right. But it, but it's hard because in that moment, early on in the retrograde, it does feel like there is this um, need for it to happen right then. And for even though you, you sometimes know that it could be a little risky or maybe you don't even anticipate the risk, you still have that internal impulse to like do that thing immediately because it looks like it needs to be addressed or the crisis needs to be addressed. But yeah, once you get to the end of it, like a month later, you realize in retrospect, you could have just put that off. Yeah, and figuring out, and so that's just a good question. Is do I need to like do the whole third times the charm journey? Because sometimes you do, or could I just save myself some trouble and you know just schedule this later? Like it would be great if I could get it done by May thirteenth, but in reality, like it's not going to kill me or anyone else if it's done by June fifth. Yeah, um, you do learn from it. I mean, I always learn. Something, something from the Mercury retrogrades when I have to do the do over, even if it is annoying or frustrating and things like that. Um, so, something I wanted to mention that I noticed is in terms of eclipse degrees, we have the Scorpio eclipse there at like 24, 25 Scorpio. Um, and Mercury, when it retrogrades, it retrogrades from Gemini back into Taurus and then it stations direct right about there at 25, 26 degrees of Taurus, which is pretty close to where that eclipse degree was of the Scorpio eclipse in mid-May at 25 Scorpio. So if anybody has especially fixed sign placements around 25, 26 degrees of any of the fixed signs, which are uh, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, those are going to be really sensitive um, points this month, not just due to the eclipses, not just due to Mercury, but also with Saturn hovering around 25 Aquarius for a good chunk of the month as well. Um, yeah, so that's something to pay attention to and also could be part of the Mercury retrograde story because Mercury during its pre-retrograde shadow period will pass over that degree once. Uh, and it looks like the date on that is around the 25th or so of April. Well, it's actually right now. Like, oh, yeah, I think like Mercury literally, right literally just entered its shadow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So Mercury's entered its shadow, which is the degree. So everything past this point may be things that, for some people, they get hit by this Mercury retrograde are things that have to be revisited or where you do something, but you end up having to come back to it at some point in the future. Yeah. yeah so, so watch this day. Watch like what's kind of percolating right now. Right. Oh no, I hope I don't have to revisit this day no. <laughs> uh, next next month. Um, all right, so that's the Mercury retrograde, um, which is, is important this month as another overlay of everything that's going on. Did we talk enough about Mars moving into to Aries and joining Jupiter and everything else? Let's say else? some nice things about Mars and Aries. I just talked about it in terms of military action. Right. But, you know, most of us are not going to be fighting in a military conflict, but we'll still be having this transit. I have a nice thing I could say. Sure. <laughs> I think so. It's like, you know, we just kind of got introduced to Jupiter and Aries, whatever that's doing in our chart. And then Mars comes in right away. So it's almost like we're going skydiving on our first date with Jupiter right. and Aries. Like, it's just like, all right, like, I just met you. This is crazy. But, you know, that song. <laughs> um, that's right. really good. I um, did a podcast with someone like five years ago. We were talking about planets and so, I think we we're talking about Mars. He was like, oh, yeah, my, my Mars is in Aries. I love skydiving. Can't get enough of it. Right. Um, one of the chart examples that I used that I always liked as a chart example was because we have a birth time, but it was um, Angelina Jolie that has Mars in Aries in the 10th house and how you know, a good chunk of her career has been like action movies, and she's known as like a, an actress that does major leading roles in action movies, amongst other things, of course. But um, in terms of how that can manifest constructively if it's connected with the tenth house, that's an interesting manifestation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, well, and our uh, the late great Alan White was a Mars and Aries in the first house and was right. literally a paratrooper. Speaking of skydiving. Yeah. He had it in the first house and he could be very, you know, brash and like forthright and um, honest to a fault of like sometimes like cursing or something, which can be off putting. But then also for his friends is somebody that could be direct and could be courageous and could like do the thing that everybody's thinking, but is too scared to do in the room at that time, which ends up being important and useful. You know, honest is also a good keyword for Aries. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It may not be appreciated or appropriate, but uh, right. it is honesty, or at least, you know, it's where they're really coming from. Yeah. We were, I was talking yesterday in an episode I recorded with Laura Nalbandian about astrology conferences and like giving some of your first lectures and how terribly that will go. And like the friend, the friend that will say, that was great. You did a great job. Like no matter what happens, but just to give positive reinforcement versus the friend that's like, yeah, you did a pretty terrible job. And and like be honest about like that thing that happened, even if it's maybe uncomfortable, let's say. Yeah. I feel like Aries is also really good at just being like very clear and to the point. Right. Like more I guess more economical about like getting places or saying things. Mm. Yeah, Aries also a spicy sign, like liking like spicy things, both literally in terms of like foods, but also metaphorically. And that, that's a good keyword because it gives you like kind of a neutral, obvious one where there's some people that like, let's say, spicy foods or like it really hot. Um, but there's other people where that that's not something that they like, but it's just a matter of taste. Yeah, and that, that's a good one in particular for Venus and Aries, right, which is matters of taste. Right. Yeah. And liking, liking spicy things. Um, all right. Well, I think that might be all of the major things that we meant to touch on in terms of the transits for this month, right? Is there anything, I mean, there's like this new moon in Gemini at the very end of the month, but because it's coming after eclipse season, it's so much less powerful and like amped up or important. And it's also probably going to overlap with the next time we do a forecast episode because it's so late in the month. So we might be able to put that off until next month. Yeah. Well, I yeah, think there just, is also, oh, sorry. Keep, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to mention, you know, Venus going into Taurus at the end of the month. Um, and I saw something, um, SJ Anderson on Twitter mentioned how like there's going to be a period in June where both Venus and Mars are in domicile. And so it's like, the areas of your life that um, got shaken up by the eclipses, those rulers are going to be like, they're going to have a chance to kind of stabilize those topics following the tumult, tumultuousness of the eclipses. Right. Yeah, Venus is certainly going to try. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so maybe one one thing about the, uh, the new moon at the end of the month, it's not an eclipse, right? And so... Um, in my experience, we don't really leave eclipse land until we get a lunation that's not an eclipse. It's sort of back into the normal cycle of time outside of the dragon roller coaster wormhole. Yeah, it's not an eclipse, but also it's one of the first in the series after a year and a half or two years where we were having eclipses that were bouncing back and forth between Gemini and Sagittarius. So one of the nice things about that is for people that were experiencing major events and turning points and major endings and beginnings in that sector of their life over the past couple of years, we finally get a much quieter eclipse where it can just be like a quiet little new beginning, but it doesn't, not all new beginnings or endings have to be hugely momentous. Sometimes they can just be small, small things. That's a nice point. It's like a little bit of retreat, reprieve for Gemini until Mars goes into Gemini for 17 years. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, the other thing, the, um, the the ruler of the Gemini new moon is Mercury is going to be stationing direct during that time. So there, it could be like not the most peaceful or chill right, well, Gemini it's, new it's, moon. Right. It's Mercury stationing in the condition we described earlier, right? In those eclipse degrees on Algol. There may be some, you know, solid information, right? Mercury's about to go direct. Um, that's not necessarily pleasant. It might be useful, but it's not necessarily pleasant. 
Yeah. Um, all right. I wanted to mention also, I forgot to mention the electional chart for this month where the featured electional chart that Lisa and I, Lisa Scheim and I picked out was in order to try to get a really good Mars electional chart. And this month that's actually possible because you have many of the most ideal um, considerations all present with both of the benefics moving through the sign of Aries and with uh, Mars also moving through its home sign. So our electional chart for this month, if you're looking for a Mars election that represents or will have many of the same qualities or archetypes of some of the more positive things that we've outlined here in terms of Aries and that archetype, then this would be the chart for, for doing that. So the chart is set for May 26, 2022 starting at about 3 a.m. with Aries rising. So this is a night chart and Mars is in Aries in its home sign in the first whole sign house and it's applying to a conjunction with Jupiter within about a degree or two. Uh, Venus is also still in Aries so it's co-present with Mars and Jupiter and helping to balance them out and make things even more positive or successful with respect to what Mars wants to initiate at this time. Since it's a nice night chart, Venus is actually the most benefic planet in this chart. Um, the moon is also in Aries in the first house, and it's applying to a conjunction with Venus um, a little bit widely, but it's still nonetheless co-present and applying um, to that conjunction. And yeah, that's basically it. It's like uh, it's also yeah, that's basically it. It's, it's a Mars election with Mars as strong and mitigated as you can possibly get in a night chart. So you're going to get many of the more constructive things that come with Mars that we've talked about in this episode. Yeah, that's if you want to time your glorious charge. Yeah, that would be the time to do it. Um, so that's the election. We've also got three or four other electional charts that we released this month to patrons in the Auspicious Elections podcast. So that's one of the benefits you can get by signing up to support our work through our page on Patreon. So you can get access to that there. Um, and I think that's it for this episode and for this forecast for May. Um, thanks both you both for joining me. Thanks, Steph, for, for joining this your first time on the podcast. But I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for inviting me. Truly a dream come true. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. What do you both, what do you have coming up this month, Steph, or, or what, where can people find out more information about your work and some of the things that you're working on? Um, so my website is ladykazimi.com and that's also my Twitter and Instagram handle is Lady Um, I don't have anything, you know, my con consultations are open. Um, I guess one thing I've been working on since I redid my website over the winter is just adding more resources to my website. And so like a lot of that is just kind of, um, I guess re rehashing some of the old stuff that I had in my old one. So one of the features that I had was, um, was a free birth chart tool, like a free birth chart lookup feature. So I'm getting, I'm working on putting that up right now. And I, uh, sort of redid a lot of the, the descriptions cause I, I had some just basic delineations like planet and sign kind of stuff. So that's going to be ready soon. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, that's exciting. Are you, are you doing any conferences this year or attending any conferences? Oh, yeah. I'll be at Norwalk. I'm not presenting, but I will be happy to say hi to you if you're there. Nice. All right. Cool. That's going to be a great conference. It's like sold out, I think, at this point or will be by the time this episode comes out. But um, I'm sure that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Austin, you are also doing Norwalk this year and I, is your workshop sold out? Uh, yeah. Well, no, actually, no, I don't know if it's sold out. There was, um, it was sold out and then the capacity was expanded. Mm. Um, so what's funny is I'll be doing the workshop later the day of your electional chart. Nice. <laughs> right. Which makes all sense. Right. Aries is my 10th. I'm going to just talk all day long. Got Mercury there. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm doing a um, workshop on Thursday and then I have two lectures at Norwalk. If you're there, come see me. And then I am starting my um, 2022 year two class um, at the beginning of May and my year three class. Um, year three, you have to have taken year two. Year two, sometimes I let some people, if they've got the year one curriculum down, can jump in without... Um, um, without having studied with me before 
if you're if you'd like to do that email me and um i've got a little 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 test you can take and we'll see you know what's appropriate obviously for returning students just let me know um and then um there is a series i elected that was moon conjunct jupiter conjunct fomalhaut um from last year actually that will be coming out during the early part of may uh fomalhaut is uh quite exciting it's um the fourth... i actually really can't wait for that <laughs> oh i'm glad you're excited i <laughs> yeah i'm a big fomalhaut fan uh there are, you know there are four royal stars and i consider the other three rather how should we say brash and unsubtle um, Fomalhaut has that same sort of excellent power, but it's much more subtle. You know, it's the, um, you know, it's the, the king of the deeps, right? It's that, that royal power that's beneath the surface. That's not like, you know, as loud and obnoxious as like Aldebaran or Antares or Regulus can be. I'm a big fan. So <clears throat> the, um, yeah, the, the Fomalhaut series is going to come out and, you know, there's um, a ton of, um, you know, we try to harvest the very best um, of each year. So there's a bunch of, uh, how should we say, um, delicious fruit preserves over the, from the last several years that are still available. I love that. That's, that's like exactly what you're doing. And it's so funny seeing when a new series is released because it's from often like eight, nine months ago. And, and then I remember I'm like, oh, yeah, there were some really great electional charts during that time. It's fun. It's fun to like let them let them marinate. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So that's fearandsunder dot com, and then your website is austincopic dot com. Um, as for myself, I'm just going kind of crazy doing the podcast and recording a bunch of episodes ahead of time, um, which I'm actually excited about getting ahead with things. I've started the new Zodiac series, and I'm going to be doing the Taurus episode soon. Um, but I recently. Um, started my local astrology group again and we hold our held our first meeting a couple like a week or two ago and I recorded that meeting and I'm going to re release it as an episode of the astrology podcast um, I'm also starting to have guests out and I have one out this week Laura Nalbandian to start recording more interviews in person and I've kind of like stocked up a bunch of interviews that I'm going to be releasing first for early access because I've got a backlog pretty far ahead of time um, so I'm going to release them to patrons for early access through my page on Patreon. And if people like this work or you enjoy um, basically the free astrology classes that I'm teaching when I release four episodes a month or two bonus episodes for a patron, then you can sign up through my page on Patreon and get bonus, bonus content like early access to episodes, the ability to atten attend live recordings, or even some private podcast episodes that are only available to patrons. Um, and also just to help support the work I'm doing and hopefully help to improve the quality of the podcast by starting to have more people out in person to record really high quality video and audio. It's only possible when we do that. So that's primarily the next stage that I'm moving into is more stuff like that. And then hopefully with some of these conferences coming up, I'm starting to think about wanting to shoot a bunch of interviews in person, for example, at the ESAR conference that's happening in August in Colorado. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to be at Norwalk, but I do want to start being able to travel again and start shooting more on location in person interviews. So that's the plan. Um, all right. I think that's it for this forecast for May of 2022. Thanks a lot, both of you, for, for joining me and doing this with me. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So please be sure to drop a comment or a like on this YouTube video. And that's it for this episode. So we'll see you again next time. A special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode.
For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code astropodcast15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune, where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline uh, basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com slash book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the Astrogold Astrology app, which is available for both iPhone and Android at astrogold.io. There are also two major astrology conferences happening this year. The first is the Northwest Astrological Conference, happening May 26th through the 30th, 2022, near Seattle, Washington. Find out more information at norwak.net. And the second is the International Society for Astrological Research Conference, which is taking place August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. And you can find out more information about that at isar2022.org. Thank you.